Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Lord, 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 Lord. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. And no one can cross from there to us, he said. Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. God, let your words be my words, and my words be your words. Amen. Do you want a drink of water? Do you want a drink of water? That's what one of my junior high students named Abby said on one of our mission trips this summer. We were volunteering at a, a homeless uh, shelter outside in a parking lot where you serve food and different resources and, and drinks. And it was a really, really hot day. Maybe one of the hottest days of the entire summer. And people were coming in and sitting, sitting under shade. And, and Abby noticed this man that walked in was sitting all alone, a big man, over six foot in height, and he looked like a linebacker from the NFL, but pretty large and intimidating fellow. Most of us would have chosen to pass him by, like leave it for somebody else to interact, but not Abby. Not Abby. You see, Abby is a follower of Jesus Christ. She has no fear. She's been captivated by the love of God. So she noticed that the man needed something. He was sweating, panting. So she walked over and said, Do you want a drink of water? And they sat there and they drank the cups and they drank the water. This four foot junior high student and this big old homeless man. And they talked and they communed over a drink of water. 
You know, these gospel lessons the last couple of weeks have been tough. Tough lessons. And Brian said last week, and it's true this week too, every time there's a tough lesson to be preached, uh, Patrick is gone. <laughs> Have you noticed this, Robert Hanley? I mean, we scheduled him, I don't know. So once again, we're faced with a very tough lesson. Many scholars call this stretch of passages uh, the rich men and the lovers of money. But I want to rephrase that. This is the question I want you to ponder. How much would you be worth if you lost all your money? How much would you be worth if you lost all your money? You know, the Gospel of Luke... And Luke himself cares tremendously about the poor. You don't read very much into it, just in chapter 1, where Luke writes Mary's prayer, where she says, He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. In the Beatitudes, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, in Luke, he doesn't say poor in spirit. He just says the poor. And he means the poor. But this lesson, this parable, is, is kind of like, uh, unlike many parables that we read, because there's not very vague language. There's not a manager or a sower. We read about real people. Some have names true identities. It almost reads as a story. And is it a true story? We don't know, but we do know about these men. So you can read this story in two ways. You can read it as their story between the rich man and Lazarus and Abraham. Or you can read it like this. Read it as a story about each of us. And so often how we create a barrier or a great abyss that separates people. This passage is like a three-act play. There's three different acts. And in the first act of the play, we realize this, that the rich appear to be rich and the poor appear to be poor. We learn about the rich man. Right? We learn about him first, and we know that he was rich and dressed in purple and fine linen, that he lived in luxury every day. We learn later that he had a lifetime of good things. He had brothers. He lived in his father's house that he inherited. We know that he read Moses and the prophets, and he did not listen. And then we learn about Lazarus a poor beggar. His name means God's help. We know that his body is covered in sores, that he laid at the rich man's gate outside of his house, just hoping for the crumbs of the food that left behind. We know that he was so sick, maybe with leprosy, that even the dogs would lick his sores. But this act is just a tableau there's no interaction between the characters. And the rich appear to be rich, and the poor appear to be poor. The characters are introduced, but there is still a separation. They were separated by a gate and a table. Now, we don't have many gates, huge gates like they did, you know, like back in the day around our homes. But so often we lived in gated communities with keypads to protect us from the people we don't want around. And then there's the second act. It's a pretty short act. Where the rich become poor and the poor become rich. Both characters die. But the order of appearance is reversed. 
In Act 1, we read about the rich man first, kind of in the order we should in our society. But now we learn about Lazarus' death first. And he's carried off into heaven by the angels, by the side and the heart of Abraham. How did he die? Did he die of leprosy or his wounds? Did he die of hunger or old age? We don't know that. We don't know, but we are challenged and reminded by Jesus who says, When you have a feast, do not invite your friends or your rich neighbors. Instead, invite the Lazaruses of the world, the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Now, when we throw parties around town, do we really do that? Do we? And then the rich man dies. But he doesn't go off into glory. He's in torment. He's in pain. Now this reminds us that not all sons of Abraham, not all good people of the line of faith will have a blessed life to come. Just because you go to Christ Episcopal Church every Sunday or that you served on vestry or that you're the youth minister or you're a priest, it doesn't get you into heaven. He reminds us of this. Which leads us to Act 3, where the poor are rich and the rich are poor. We learn that the rich man is in Hades or, or some type of hell, and he's being tormented, and that Lazarus is by Abraham's side. Kind of an unusual image of heaven, but don't get caught up in that image. There's much more to be talked about. But somehow they are interacting in some way. And being in the side of the bosom of Abraham is a great reward for those who are invited. And this rich man is far from it. Talking about this passage, the great father of our faith, one of them named Ambrose, said this, and it's to be noted. Not all poverty is holy. And not all people who live in poverty live holy lives. But are riches criminal? But as luxury disgraces riches, so does holiness commend poverty. You see, the rich man in this text was most likely a very religious man. But he never considered what it's like to really be transformed by the love of God. When we're truly changed by the love of God through Jesus Christ, our conversion should be much more than a spiritual or theological repentance. When we follow the love of God, our entire lives change. Just not the way we spiritualize things, but by the way we act and live. Following Jesus changes everything about us. All of our energy is directed away from the self. But in Act 3, there's exchange between the characters. And the rich man cries out to Abraham and says, I'm in pain and torment. Please send Lazarus down to give me a drink of water. He's thirsty. I bet it, but it's like San Antonio on a hot August day. Pretty hot. He needed a drink. But notice something about this conversation. He knew Lazarus' name. He knew the man he passed by every single day and disregarded him. And he still treated him like a servant or a slave. But Abraham reminds him that he had some pretty cool stuff when he was alive. Had everything he ever wanted. But now there's a great abyss that separates them that cannot be closed. He could have said to the rich man, it's the same abyss you created while you're on earth with him. The rich man created the separation. The 
second request is, and the third request are very similar. He, he cries out to Abraham and, and says, if you can only send Lazarus back to warn his family and his brother about the doom that lies ahead. And Abraham, both times, stronger each time, reminds him that they have Moses and the prophets to read. They had a chance to learn it. Isaiah says, to really truly break the chains of injustice, you should give clothes to the needy, you know, feed the hungry, visit the sick, visit those in prison, visit the Lazaruses of the world. They had those, and they forgot to listen. And so at the end of the story, the rich man remains in torment. A painful end to the story. But we get a better idea of this great abyss that's been formed. Not only after we die, but here on earth between the rich and the powerful and the poor. One of my heroes, one of my faith heroes is a man named Jean Venet. He founded a, a community of people who are disabled and have special needs. Smart, smart man and a pastor. Writing in a book called Becoming Human, he wrote about this passage. And it's probably the best commentary on Luke 16. He says this, The story of Lazarus tells us a lot about today's world where there is a huge abyss between those who have food, money, comfort, and those who are hungry and have no place of their own. He says, what is this abyss that separates people? Why are we unable to look straight in the eye of Lazarus and listen to him? You know, we've all been there. I know I have. We're driving down the road at a at red light, and we run into somebody who is begging. And we just think to ourselves, if we don't make eye contact, we'll get out of this. And you're just kind of, you know, hoping, you know, you're like looking at your cell phone. And somehow it makes us nervous. Because our fear is dictating our actions. But what are we truly afraid of? To give up a, a, a dollar of our money away? That's kind of the easy part. The easy part is really connecting or making eye contact or even we're starting a, rela a relationship or a conversation with somebody like that. <laughs> he says, we exclude Lazarus because we are frightened that our hearts will be touched if we enter into a relationship with him. If we listen to his story and hear his cry of pain, we'll discover that he is a human being and actually we discover that we're a lot like him. We don't want that. That's why it's dangerous to enter into a relationship with the Lazaruses of the world. If we do, we risk our lives, we risk our businesses, or maybe our church being changed. Why? What prevents anyone from crossing from one side to the other? What makes this separation between the rich and the poor unbridgeable? Why do we have such a hard time crossing over? The rich is a closed club. The word is fear. Our fear prevents crossing over. Fear that our hearts will be moved if we have direct contact with the poor. Fear that if we touch the poor, we might be touched in ways that makes us vulnerable. But you know what? Christ was vulnerable with each and every one of us. We were like Lazarus. We, we didn't deserve much. But he refused to pass you by. There's a lot of great solutions of how we can take care of the poor. There's great needs of hunger in our city, of low-income housing, all over the place. But so often, as a body, we choose to pass them by.
You know, we're about to sing a song during communion called Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. It's a beautiful gospel hymn. You're going to sing it in communion while you're walking up, standing next to each other. I kind of want you to look around the room and see Lazarus is all over, because Lazarus are all over the place. In this room, it doesn't matter how rich and poor you actually are. But we know that God will never pass us by. He never slumbers nor sleeps. He's from everlasting to everlasting. And we know he won't pass us by. So I want you to change the lyric. As followers of Jesus Christ who have been changed by the love of God, we should never pass anyone by. So redirect that song to the people in this room and outside these walls. This text is a text that we had scheduled since they created the lectionary, I guess. But it came on a week where our city right now is trying to figure out what to do with panhandlers all throughout the city. Right? And it's a hard thing to figure out. It's difficult. And there's great intentions all over the place. Even the people who seem like they don't have great intentions. Like the politician who said, the panhandlers are like flies escaping from a screen door. And we must try to figure it out. He probably has good intentions, but I believe the church has a response. And to begin with, we should see people as human beings and not flies that escape through a screen door. Maybe then we can truly reach them. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. I'm reminded of this all the time by my friend Abby, our junior high student, and my friend William, who was this homeless man I got to know and lived with for a while, and when he was passing away from cancer, he was at a health clinic, and we would go and take care of all his needs, and he got really busy, all the scheduling of the doctor's appointments, all the stuff we had to take care of, and I was busy working at a church, and had a lot on my mind, so when I would go visit him, it was kind of like business. But every once in a while, he wanted to go for a walk outside of the courtyard, and this is true, to feed the raccoons. A little patch of raccoon, you know, raccoons. And I said, okay, let's, let's go do that. We were walking by and going down this long hallway to get out to the courtyard. And all of a sudden, I'm talking to him like, remember, you have an appointment on Tuesday. Remember, you have all this stuff to do. And I have this, you know. And all of a sudden, he's not there. Like, where did he go? Where did William go? And then I went down this hallway we just walked through, and he's there kind of pushing this wheelchair. I'm like, William, William what are you, you can't be doing that. What are you doing? He says, oh, this man wants to feed the raccoons too. I'm taking him to where he wants to go. I blew that. I didn't even see that guy. I passed him by. I didn't even realize it because I wasn't paying attention. But you know what? Paying attention matters because our life depends on it. Our afterlife depends on it. And it's just as easy as saying, do you need a drink of water? Amen.